Grab your Bibles. Let's get ready to go to the Word. Um, what I'm going to do today, we have communion service, and I want to allow room for the Holy Spirit just to move and have His way. So I'm going to lay foundation today for a two-part series that I'll be talking about. So today I just want to introduce you to um, what we'll be sharing, and then we're going to walk through that a little further so that God would move and have his way in our midst. So go with me to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. And I just want to whet your appetite a little bit, then next week we'll come and we will dig further into this so that God would move and have his way in our midst. And I'm going to invite you to keep your Bibles open so we can talk through this, that God would have his way. If you're there, say amen. This is what Genesis chapter 32 says. Um, I'm going to read the passage in its entirety and then we'll talk. Verse 22, jump down to verse 22, right in the middle of that. It says, that same night, he being Jacob, arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Verse 24 says, from the ESV, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for, my, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then he said to Jacob, um, what is your name? And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, hallelujah, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he says, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And the sun rose up as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Let us pray together. Father, you are wonderful. Lord, you're gracious. Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're kind. As we explore a passage of Scripture, God, that has timeless truths, Speak clearly, God. Let us hear from you, God. Let us make the necessary adjustments to be who you would have us to be. So Felix dies, like I say every week, God, and move out of the way so you can be God. So God, as we share just a few thoughts this morning, lay in foundation for what you want done. We give our heart, we give our time to you, that you may be glorified. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. So I want to begin here as we put this uh, thought on the screen. I want you guys to track with me. Um, brokenness is the key to encountering God face to face. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Brokenness is the key to encountering God face to face. Turn to your next other neighbor and say, other neighbor. Brokenness is the key to encountering God. Face to face. Amen. Brokenness is something that I think we all, if you've been in this journey any length of time, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Come on, come on. Anybody know that? We know what we're talking about, right? That God wants to do to get us to where we need to go. I want to share a couple of quotes with you um, as we kind of walk through this. If we can, seems like we're having some chance. Go to the next. I want to kind of talk through this. God uses broken things. Watch this. It says it takes broken soil to produce a crop. It takes broken clouds to give rain. It takes broken grain to give bread. It takes broken bread to give strength. And it takes a broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. And we know the story about Peter. It was Peter weeping bitterly who returns to greater power than ever. It takes a level of brokenness. Does anybody, anybody believe that this morning? 
Come on, it takes a, a level of brokenness for God to move and have his way. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. It seems like they're having some challenges back there. Um, here, here's what um, it was um, Chuck Swindoll who says that, that God cannot use you greatly until he first hurts you. Come on. Deeply. Come on, y'all look. Y'all with me? That he can't use you greatly until he first hurts you deeply. Listen to what A.W. A. Tozer has his version of that. He says, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly. Right? Here's me. This is me. This is me. I want the blessing, but I don't want to go through the process. <laughs> am I by myself? Come on, am I by myself? Yeah, because I, I will, sometimes I want to forfeit the blessing when the process, you kind of get what I'm saying? But, but I want to stand before you today to say, to get to the blessing, we've got to go through the process so that God could move and have his way. I want to look at the, the protagonist of this story, this fellow by the name of Joseph, the main character, jo, um, Jacob, that the main character of this story that's in front of us. Most of us know him by this whole issue of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know him to be a forefather of the Christian faith of the Israelites. We know him to be this famous biblical character. And it was prophesied biblically that he was going to be great, that through him, God was going to bless the nation. God was going to do everything that the, the seed of Jesse was going to come through that. But does anybody in here know that Jacob had some problems? Did y'all know that Jacob had some problems? And before God could get him to the place of blessing, God needed to work out of Jacob what was in Jacob so that when God starts to use Jacob, it doesn't look like it's Jacob doing his stuff. It is God working through him. Come on, does anybody know that? Let me give you a quick rundown of Jacob's bio. Then we're going to talk through the one thing I want to share with you uh, this morning. Here's the thing. He, he, Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to this twin. They were prophesied that they would have two sons. Uh, they would be that God was going to, two nations was going to be in, in their mom's womb. And here's the story you need to know. Jacob comes out. And at his birth, he's grabbing his brother's heel. So they named him Trickster because even at birth, he seemed to have manipulative traits about himself. His brother comes out and he's called Red Earth because he's hairy and his skin tone is red and he looks like he comes just from the earth. And you all know this as the story continues as Jacob's resume is read. Here's what we find out that as he starts to grow, he, he manipulates his brother because his brother was hungry. If you've been in, the, in, in church any length of time, you've heard this. He manipulates his brother into getting his brother's birthright. Come on. Because his brother was hungry. Manipulative tactics. Not only that, but the firstborn is always the one to receive the blessing. So Esau was born first. When their daddy Isaac was old and about to pass on, it was time to give the blessing to the firstborn son. His mama got involved and they manipulated daddy to bless Jacob as opposed to blessing Esau. Well, if your name is Esau... And your brother steals your stuff. You're not happy. Come on. So Esau vowed that he was going to get even with Jacob by way of killing him. Mama intervenes and then mama sends the boy to Laban, her brother, in hiding for some length of time to protect him from Esau's wrath. Jacob now goes to Esau, and he I mean to Laban, and he spends a uh, an enormous amount of time at Laban's house. Let me just fast forward. He gets married to two women by the name of Leah, another one by the name of Rachel. They give birth to 11 children. And after time has elapsed at Laban's house, stuff gets a little rough there. And now Jacob has to make the journey back home to his original house. Here is the providence of God. Because Jacob now has to go from Laban's house back home, God just so fixed it that the only way for him to get to Laban's house to where his mama lived was he had to pass through where Esau lived. Y'all get it. You're starting to get it. You're starting to get it. 
He's starting to get it. Being the manipulator that he is, being the way that he's used to manipulating every situation, every circumstance, we get to chapter 32, and at chapter 32, if you were to read that chapter in its entirety, it chronicles and it details the series of things that Jacob is doing to prepare himself such that when Esau sees him, he would have smoothed thing over, things over, and Esau would have forgotten what happened. Anybody in here know that you might have plans, but God also is going to have? <laughs> Come on, does anybody know that? Is it, is it just, are you with me? If, if you were to read chapter 32, here's what it, the word got to him as he's sojourning with his two wives and his 11 children. Hey, man, he's got people out front because he, he split them up in case um, Esau sees them. He wouldn't take over um, Jacob's entire household. Word got back to Jacob that Esau is coming with 400 men. Scared brother to death. Four, come on, y'all. 400 men. So Esau's tripping. I mean, Jacob is tripping. He's afraid for his life. And let me just read this one thing. And next week, we're going to go into a lot more detail of this. Look at chapter 32 and jump down to right about um, verse yeah, 19. Let me pick up in verse 19 and I'm going to the text. So verse 19 says, he likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. In other words, he split his family up and he sent them ahead of them in group. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. Listen to what you shall say. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. And he thought that I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward, I shall see his face. Perhaps it says, he will what? Accept me. So let me tell you what's going on. Then let me hurry up to the text. He split his group up and he's sending a whole bunch with a whole lot of gifts and a whole lot of animals and a whole lot of stuff. And he says, listen, if, if, J, if, if you bump into Esau and he says, what's this? Here's what you say to Esau. These are gifts that Jacob has for you. That's what he said. And then if he takes those gifts and he gets past them and he bumps into another bunch, here's what that group ought to say. These are gifts that Jacob has for you. And then if he goes to another group and he sees you, he's going to say, these are gifts. And here's what his strategy and his plan, that if I give him enough stuff. If I give him enough stuff, by the time he meets me, his heart, it says, is going to be all right. But watch the text. Verse 22 picks up. It says that same night, he, being Jacob, arose and took his two wives and two female servants and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm wondering why in the world would you cross a river at nighttime? <laughs> I'm crossing during the day. Where I can see the fish, I can see the rock, I can see everything. It's painting a picture of how terrified this man was. Are you with me? That he waited till the sun had settled to do what he needed to do. Now, I want to begin here. That if we're going to talk about brokenness, I want you to hear me say, first of all, this morning, brokenness begins with an encounter with God. Come on, repeat after me. Say, brokenness. Begins with a personal encounter with God. Notice I did not say a group encounter, but a what? Personal encounter. I'm going to say it one more time. I did not say a group encounter. I said a what? Personal encounter. 
So watch the text as we kind of walk through this. It says, that same night he arose and he took his two wives and two female servants and his 11 children and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok and he took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Let me, he took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. I'm going to walk through this because I just want to share this one thing. So listen to this. Number one, if we're going to get to the place where we have a personal encounter with God, there is a place in our journey where we must get to the position where we eliminate everything that could potentially distract us from encountering God. Okay? Now hear me, hear me. Some of this may not make sense on the surface because when I read this text, I am perplexed. Because here's me. If I am running from Esau and I'm afraid of what Esau is going to do, such that I am manipulating everything to position me to a place of safety. Now, y'all got to see this. He takes his wives, and he crosses over the Jabbok with his wives, and he tells them, you all go on. He goes back across, and he grabs his children, and he takes his children, and he puts them over across the Jabbok, and he tells them, go on. Now, if I'm Jacob, I'm saying, okay, I'm already across. The text says he goes back all by himself. <laughs> you ever find yourself doing things that makes no sense? <laughs> and, and it's in the nonsensical thing where you say, what am I doing? Why am I here? Come on, y'all. Why, why am I? And, and don't you find that? You, are, you don't ask yourself those questions when the wife is there and when the children is there and when everything is there. It's when we find ourselves all, all I wish I had somebody in here, all alone, we end up asking those questions. What in the world am I doing? I'm trying to tell you when you're all alone, God has a way. I'm saying, I know you think, hear me carefully, you did this, but I did it so I could meet you. Yeah. Come on, talk to me this morning, right? So, so let me hurry up, let me hurry because I don't want to be, I don't want to be before y'all long, right? Go to the next thing here. I want y'all to see the next thing. Not, not only do we need to, to eliminate distractions, but, but lock into this. God will prevent us from completely crossing over until we encounter him at those crossroads. Here's what I said. He was already across. <laughs> he was already across. And some brought him back. Y'all not hearing me this morning. I'm going to say, he was already across. But some brought him back. Because I want you to hear me say this. You got to lock this. God will never allow you to completely cross over into your destiny. Come on now. Until he does what he needs to do in us so that on the other side, I wish I had somebody. It doesn't look like me. It looks like him. Here's what you need to remember. This is why the importance of the literary context. Jacob was a manipulator. Come on, Jacob was a trickster. Jacob had problems, but even in his shortcomings, God had still released a word over his life. He was God's child. He was God's promise. He was God. Come on, does that make sense? Now, can we be honest this morning? Listen, what you see in front of you today is not who I always were. Yesterday, I had some Jacob in me. Y'all can fake the funk all you want. I knew you had some Jacob in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's the truth of the matter. Even as Jacob, God still used me. Oh, no. Oh. Y'all not ready for this. 
And, and, and even as Jacob, God still used you. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because the gift and the callings are without repentance. If God gifted you, God gifted you. Are you with me? But there is a place, there is a place where God will grace you to be Jacob. But when he gets ready to take you to the next level, come on now, to get, he's going to take the Jacob out of you. And even though you might already be a cross, he has a way of getting you back, yeah, yeah, of pulling you back so he can do what he needs to do. Why are you saying that, preacher? God's not going to let you be next level with all your junk, all your manipulative tactics, all your shortcomings. I wish I had somebody in here. All your foolishness. Like a dog, he's going to grab your coattail and he's going to say, get on back over here all by yourself. He'll do that. Tell your neighbor, say, he'll do it. Come on, say, he'll do it. He'll do it. I checked every commentary to say, what in the heck? Yo, bro, your cross run. That's what I said. You don't cross the run. Don't look back. Or, I would run. <laughs> Y'all remember Jonah, right? Jonah tried that. God went and got him, got a big fish, and come on, y'all know it. Hooked him up and, re yeah, y'all know it. So, so listen, he's going to pull you back. And then, notice this. He will engage you in those lonely moments to cause you to engage the challenging things that impedes the realization of his purpose for your life. Y'all get this? I'm almost done. He didn't pull Jacob back for the mere pleasure of pulling him back. He says, now that I got you, let's talk about your manipulative ways. <laughs> because you see, Jacob, here's what Jacob said. Maybe, let me, give, let me give Esau the time to get all them gifts. Let me give him time to calm down. And he thought he was buying time for when he encountered Esau. But the whole time, God was buying time for him to meet God. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, come on, y'all. The whole time, God was buying time for him to meet, you, you kind of get what I'm saying? So, so lock into this, lock into this. Here's what this looks like, and here's what that says to me, is that because if I encounter my enemy in my mode, they're going to see me, and it's not going to be pretty. One of us going to lose, right? But if they see me after God had finished a work with me, ah, uh, ah, uh, turn it even and say, neighbor, God is trying to get you. So notice this, notice this, and I'm, I'm done. So God's going to show up, and, 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 and he's going to engage you in a struggle. Now, I need to say this. I'm going to mess you up a little bit, and I want to stop here to give you a whole week to think about it. <laughs> Watch the text. See, the problem with me and the problem with you is because we have the whole Bible we jump to the end, and we know how the story ends. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because here's what you're already saying. Oh, he was wrestling with God. You know that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say to you a minute, he did not. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. It says here, Jacob was left alone. And my translation says, and a man wrestled with him until the what? Breaking of what? Now, please understand with me, what you just read was not written from the vantage point of where God sits. Why are you saying that, preacher? 
if it was written through the lens of God, then the author would have said, he sat there alone and God wrestled with him. It was written from a humanistic perspective saying that at the time of the incident, Jacob had no idea who it was. Give yourself all the literary context I just shared with you. He's running from his brother. Are you with me? So in his mind, I'm hiding, expecting any moment for somebody to show up. Come on. And then out of nowhere, somebody jumps on him. Here's his first thought. Either it's Esau or it's one of Esau's men. I wish I had somebody. Yeah, yeah. And so notice what he did. He engages in battle for his life. I wish I had somebody. And, 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 and this is going to mess you up because you have to see, this is not just a chokehold. Come on, there's some tossing. Y'all know what wrestling is. If you do your work on the, the Hebrew, what's nuanced in that word, they are literally fighting. They are literally throwing blows. I mean, come on, let me jump ahead. These blows were going so strong that one blow caught him on his hip, and it literally broke his hip. Come on, that, that's not a little tap. Come on, I'm talking about how intense this fight was. And hear me, he had no idea. He in everything in Jacob said, I'm fighting one of Esau's people or an enemy of mine. I'm going to say this and I'm going to stop. God could use your worst enemy to engage you in battle. And his purpose is not to kill you, but it's begin to begin the process of taking out of you I wish I had something. What's not like him? Some of us could be so spiritual that we could miss God in the fight, not because of God, but because of what is in, I wish I had somebody, in us. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because here's what this looks like. Somebody comes up to you and they rub you wrong. And if your inside isn't right, you can't see God using your worst enemy. I wish I had somebody. Your worst enemy to engage you to begin the process of purifying, of breaking you, of revealing to you who you really are. Because hear me out, the only reason I did the crazy thing I do and I fought the people I did and I acted the way I did, it wasn't so much because of them, it's because of what's in me. And because if the God is in me, I'm going to hope I wish I had somebody in me. So God has to get us to a place of brokenness and lock into this. He can operate in any vehicle he wants to to do what he wants done. Oh my gosh. Here's what we say. The devil. Let me give you some biblical examples. I'm going to stop. Because this is, this is messing you up. I can tell right now. Everything in Joseph when he was thrown in the pit was saying, I'm going to kill him. Ain't nobody but the devil send them brothers of mine to do that to me. But when he got to the throne, oh, that wasn't the devil. That was God taking out my arrogant spirit because I thought I was all that because I had this cord of many colors and I was a dreamer. So God used them to put, ah, uh, but he didn't see that until he got to the throne. And a lot of us forget that your destiny is not the pit. Your destiny is the throne. But we fight like we belong in the pit. And because we fight like we belong in the pit, we can't see God in the pit. I wish I had somebody. We know how the story ends. And I'm saying that to say from Joseph's vantage point, he was not thinking God. And he fought like Joseph would fight. I mean, like Jacob would fight. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Brokenness begins with an encounter with God. 
And if we're going to see God face to face, it won't always happen in worship. It, the brokenness won't always happen when the word is being released. Sometimes it could be at home in your marriage. How you fight in the relationship. Because God could be working through your spouse. But because they don't come to church, here's what you ain't no God in that. <laughs> So you're not going to like this. From jo Jacob's vantage point, you could not convince him that that wasn't one of Esau's men. Everything he did was preparing him for this encounter. So I want to start here. Don't discount the encounters you and I have in life. God's goal with me and God's goal with you is brokenness so I can reflect his character. So, so here's what Genesis 22 said. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. So here's what that, the transferable principle. I could be driving down 6th Avenue, and God could say, let me test Felix. And he'll send somebody in front of me and cut me off. If I still got the one finger wave and he's trying to get it out of me, are you with me? Because his, his expected response is regardless of what the world does to me, they encounter God, they don't encounter me. And so God will do whatever he needs to do to clean me. Are you with me? He will use whoever he needs to. Come on, I want y'all to hear me. To filter stuff in me. So when people encounter me, they encounter, watch this, a broken vessel to be used by God. Does that make sense? Man, I wish, I'm going to give y'all some examples uh, in, in my own marriage next week of how God had to break me, how God had to break us, how God had to break some things. And because I don't know what God is doing, I'm fooling myself into thinking the fight is here. I mean, I'm done, but Ephesians still says it's not against what? But we don't get it. Ain't God in you. They know God in you, Scott. You'll function in the flesh. I'm going to fight you. But I don't see what God, I don't see the throne because I'm so focused on the pit. Does this make sense? I want to stop here. I want to stop here because I'm going to pick this up next week. Brokenness is not easy. It's not fun. It's painful because somebody has to die. In case you're missing this, this is the beauty of what we're about to do, right? He took the hit so you and I can be right with him. Come on, choir. Come on. And what I want to do this morning is I want us to see Jesus on Calvary. And I want us to take a time to do an introspection. Come on, musicians. I mean, ministers and elders, take your place. I want us to see ourselves. And begin the process of saying, God, what is it in me that you want out? Is there still Jacob traits in me that you want out? What are you doing, Lord? And allow God to be God. Come on, stand to your feet all over this building. Stand up to your feet all over this building. I'd move. Bow your heads with me, and as you're bowing your heads, I want you just to spend a time just in a word of praying, saying, God, speak, God, move, God, have your way, God, direct. Search your hearts and say, God, I am searching me. I am looking introspectively at myself, Lord, and if there's things in me that is not like you, Holy Spirit, move them. Holy Spirit, take them out. Holy Spirit, adjust me. The goal of God is brokenness so we can see him face to face. And a lot of us can't see him face to face yet, not because he's not revealing himself, because we are our own blockage. So in your prayer, God, purify me. God, open my eyes. 
God, enable me to see. Be God in our midst, Lord. So by your heads, Holy Spirit, you're wonderful, God. Holy Spirit, you're gracious. Holy Spirit, you're magnificent. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful. As we look at the passage of Scripture, God, with this whole Jacob and Esau scenario, God, there's something you're saying to us, something you're saying to me, something you're saying to each and every person here that you want us to look like you. You want us to be more like you. So, God, if there's one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, one here that's going through a challenge, God, I'm praying for a moment of self-reflection and introspection so we can all see ourselves in you. We give this time to you, God, that you be glorified in your name. Amen.